I wanted to spend some time in this panel just talking to um, some of the vendors who are at the, I guess, the cutting edge of delivering cloud solutions, what you might call uh, cloud native vendors in many cases, uh, and certainly um, those who are, are getting there. Um, I guess you're all vendors, but really this comes down to how cloud is, is used by customers. So um, is this something that's being driven and asked for by customers, or is cloud something that everybody's doing just because everyone is doing it? Uh, let me, I'll start at the, the left and work yeah. along. So Eric, you, you kind of- is this, is, this <coughs> is this on or is it? It is yeah. on. It yeah. is on, yeah. perfect. Uh, I think uh, where we are right now, I think it's even so that it's um, beyond the technology choice. It's more of like it's starting to define our customer's business. Whether they use it or not, it's defining competition, technology in the end, and, and so on. So I think it's a clear yes. Uh, whether it's all cloud, hybrid, hybrid cloud, cloud business models, that's a different story. But it, everyone is moving in that direction, yes. Good. Uh, I, I forgot to introduce you properly as CEO. <laughs> Vidispine has been a cloud native company. I'll introduce everyone as we go along. Um, uh, Paul Thompson from Avid, a big, obviously well-known company. <laughs> Clearly not a company that was started in the cloud, but you've been heading in that way. So what's been driving that? Well, I think from a, a customer perspective, all the customers are, are starting at different points. And it's, it's quite clear when we have discussions with, with the customers that you know, if we really get into what they really want to accomplish, the business outcomes are substantially different to, to what they can achieve today with the traditional on-premise solution. So from a, from a strategy perspective, what we're very keen to provide is a platform that's open, that's, that can allow media to flow around the organization. But the important aspect from a, a cloud perspective is that we don't want to prescribe to the customer how they deploy it. We want to give the customer the choice of, do they want to continue to use it on-prem? Do they want to use it in a hybrid way? Or do they want to use it as purely 100% cloud native? Mickey, we heard obviously Tim's one of your yeah. customers using your solution. Um, so Amadi is a company um, that you represent. That's kind of what I would call a cloud native company. So I guess for you, it's cloud or nothing. But you're, I suppose, using that in a way to challenge maybe some of the incumbents in the, the play out and the automation and the play out services space. Yeah, I think what we're trying to do is um, provide enough information so clients can make an informed decision on which way they go. I mean, there's a number of different routes, whether they use public, private, cloud, um, and uh, where they host the equipment, as Tim mentioned. You know, we can do it in a data center. We can do it right on the edge. Uh, we can actually do it virtually as well. So it really depends on uh, what the circumstances are with the client and what they want to achieve with it. But normally it's about efficiencies, driving down costs, um, uh, and making the uh, uh, revenues grow within the business. Great, and our fourth panelist, Ranki Sankaranarayanan, is CEO of Prime Focus Technologies. And again, you've been kind of real proponents of the cloud right from the outset. What's been the driver there? I think eight, nine years ago, if I had said cloud, you know, customers would have said, get out of here. But I think, uh, you know, I think more recently, if we don't sort of talk about cloud in the first, you know, few minutes of our conversation, you know, there's an obvious question saying, don't you do much in the cloud? I think there is a paradigm shift I've seen over the last uh, uh, few years. Um, I think more recently, I think what, uh, is driving the, the cloud adoption is more business-led. Um, you know, I think you know, our customers, especially broadcasters today, are defining their, their competitors have become very different. Uh, today, most of them having you know, direct-to-consumer platforms, and suddenly they seem to compete with, you know, as they call the F companies and G companies. And so, naturally, they all have, you know, they build technology once, put it up once, up on the cloud. And, whether you're in Thailand or Silicon Valley or, or, or in Buenos Aires, it's the same platform that sort of manifests itself. So the cost of innovation is very high. And, and so um, the notion of broadcasters also sort of building technology platforms at once and sort of making sure that there is centralization, there's standardization of technology that is there. And so I think cloud sort of becomes obvious, uh, you know, uh, mm. in, in that kind of construct. So, so picking up on that kind of question of the value it's creating, I think, uh, I, I chaired a discussion at IBC this year where we talked about this, and I think the one conclusion was actually there are many benefits from cloud, but the economics may not be top of the list. So I'm keen to get your ideas of uh, <coughs> what value does a cloud-based solution 
offer to a broadcaster or a media company? Is, is that real value, or is it just some sort of cloud snake oil that, that, that everyone's using? Who, who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, no, there, there can be real tangible benefits. I mean, if they're already using cloud storage, then we can do like intra-cloud bucket transfers, um, and that saves on cost of um, hauling the media backwards and forwards. So there's, there's definitely tangible costs in using cloud. Eric, what are you seeing with the sort of media asset management world? Yeah, I think it's about uh, agileness. People tend to think that cloud is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's also about get deploying very small installs at the same and multi-tenant and be able to be flexible in who you, for what we call from file to audience, where, where, where that audience pop-ups for the next few hours and so on. So it's, it's agileness and scalability in both directions. I, I think I would go further. I think I would, I would say you know, that the challenges we see our customers having is how do you how do you create better stories? How do you create them faster? And um, you know, if you take an existing workflow today and move it to the cloud, it'll, it'll probably work. Will it work in the best possible way? That's to be debated. But if you start thinking about all of the things that the technology in the cloud can add to the content creation process, then it's a whole new type of workflow I mean, I guess the, the, the next case study uh, will hear some interesting uh, uh, activity around using AI to enrich uh, content from uh, quickly. But also, you know, let's let's spin forward another couple of years. How will AI create its own workflow? So, you know, today workflows are reasonably static. Maybe there's some manual intervention. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it's quick to facilitate a new platform. What about if we go completely hands off and, and let the AI do that? So that's interesting. Let me pick up with, with you on this one, Ram Keith. Maybe to date we've been thinking about quote unquote lifting and shifting workflows and putting them into the cloud because maybe there's some efficiency and it can scale and et cetera, et cetera. Have we been missing the point with that and the real driver is perhaps unlocking new stuff that we could never do before? I think it's a combination. First of all, to your earlier question, I think uh, uh, to my mind, I think the transition to cloud uh, while there are many other benefits, I think cost benefits uh, is a given. Uh, as far as we, we are concerned, you know, the total cost of operations, managing the total cost of operations uh, you know, is a given from a cloud perspective. And so it, it, it ought to be lower than what you had ever sort of experienced before. But the question of lift and shift, I think the transition to cloud um, is an important topic. Uh, I think we don't believe in lift and shift. Uh, and that's why we sort of, right from day one, have this hybrid cloud model where we continue to sort of leverage on-prem infrastructure that has been there, sunk capital, and consequently is trying to use that. But the key sort of thing that we did is sort of standardized one application. You know, the infrastructure, storage, transcode, and stuff like that can be sort of local and so on, but the application is what we centralize. And that, I think, works very well from just the, you know, you're not sort of going from sort of, you know, lift and shift, but there can be a gradual transition uh, to the cloud. Great, so in a moment, as technology vendors, I'm gonna turn the focus to, to what it means to build a cloud solution versus a traditional one, but let's take a couple of questions that have come in because there's a few interesting ones here. Um, first one, I'll take the one that's top of the list. Multiple clouds exist, and I guess that means multiple public cloud providers, so uh, AWS, Azure, Google, Google Cloud Platform, and others. Um, is that causing a problem in adoption? Um, I, I wouldn't have thought so. Generally, I see the trend being that more Flexibility is a good thing. I would say we're pretty agnostic. You know, we can run on a private or public cloud. So there's, there's no real issue there with, uh, with being yeah. able to use different um, uh, instances. Uh, I think from a, a, a cost perspective, they're reasonably equal. I, I think from one of the things we've discovered is that from a, a hybrid deployment, uh, we're doing a lot of work with, with Microsoft Azure, and we see the, the uh, on-prem stack has been interesting because it's, it's an interesting stepping stone to go into full public cloud. The benefits of, of cloud as an operating system, shall we say, but actually deploy it in your own hardware and your own infrastructure. Great, now I'm gonna take a question that came in just, just a moment ago, because that leads into this theme of how does a cloud-based solution look differently in terms of how you develop it from a, a maybe a traditional, obviously hardware or, or so on-premise software. And the question is, um, if, unless your solution is born in the cloud, then can it really ever be fully cloud ready in terms of the benefits and, and optimization that come in? So in other words, if you take a bit of existing software, virtualize it and run it on a VM on cloud infrastructure, is that the real deal or are you missing out on that, Eric? <coughs> yeah, so um, I've been doing both. <laughs> um, so I have some insights into this. And I would say that 
you need to do your homework, not only on technology, but also on business models, sales, go to market, margin structures, everything. And, um, uh, and if you're not, there's a Swedish word for that called a rökt, uh, which means that you have nowhere to go otherwise, otherwise than, than really redesign everything you do and re-strategize. Because it's not just about technology, it's also about how you organize yourself to live in an as-a-service model, software infrastructure and platform as-a-service, which is completely different compared to like a project-based, in my case, MAM, uh, um, MAM environment. Uh, but also pricing models. You have to realize that cloud is about commoditization. And in a, in a commoditized world, uh, you have completely different metrics on how you succeed compared to in a kind of high-end, uh, few vendor, bespoke kind of world. So it's, it's radically different, I would say. That's quite interesting. So perhaps we've all been guilty of thinking too much about workflows and technology that underpin the cloud <coughs> and missing the point that unless you completely uh, build your business around a cloud and as a service model where the revenue is different and the sales model is different, then, then you may not be successful. So at Avid, you've had to kind of make that transition a bit or, or going through that transition. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd answer the question maybe with, a, with uh, taking the, the persona of a, of a user. The user really doesn't care what the tech is. If it's deployed on cloud or if it's deployed on hybrid or if it's deployed on-prem, they still want to have the same quality of service as they have had. And if there's extra capability there, that's fantastic. So you know, we need to be very careful as vendors to make sure we don't get carried away with the, the technical intricacies of how it's deployed. Ultimately, it's that the users have to be comfortable adopting it and see extra benefit, be it being able to get to more content more easily wherever that content's been created. And Nicky and Ramke, you maybe have a slight advantage here in that you were sort of born in the cloud. Yeah. Um, has that meant that you've been able to construct your businesses in a, a different way? Um, yeah, I think being, you know, being able to, being a SaaS model, I think you, you have that advantage. You know, we strongly believe, we tell CFOs that, you know, you go put your cash flow into content rather than technology that obsoletes every day. Content that's cr created kind of, you know, <coughs> brings you annuity revenue on the back of, uh, so, so it's clearly there is a commercial argument that we can make. But, but more importantly, uh, the, 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 the being advanced, I mean, being on the cloud is you're innovating in one place. And so as you, you know, every release of yours, brings in new features and new value to customers and they are able to sort of embrace that if, you know, as against the on-prem. I think that's the bigger attraction. Mm. And Mickey, it was interesting at Amagi that you, you took the view of not just creating some technology but thinking about the services that go around that, such as the, the, the network center that uh, Tim mentioned. Yeah, um, creating that as well as doing things with um, uh, rendering services in the cloud as well and a whole bunch of other ancillary services that we can put on top of that. So it's about building out those and, and listening to the clients as well and see what their requirements are. So it's very important. There's no point in building a service that uh, nobody's going to use. So it, it's really key to listen to what the clients are asking for and develop it around there. You know, from a, um, a pop-up channel that's up there for a day, a week, or a year, um, you know, they're the sort of services that clients are coming to us and asking for. So let's take another couple of questions if we can, just because I, I think some of them pick up on that. Um, there's one question I think is great, which is about how people are buying through the cloud. So think of us as technology vendors wanting to create cloud services. You've got to do a lot, as we've said, in terms of the technology and the business model. But are the buyers who are in the room, are they changing enough? And are they still trying to shoehorn cloud into very traditional procurement models where there's long cycles and so on? Eric, what, what have you Yeah, no, I think it's been, there's been a, a quick change in that just the last 12 or 18 months, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming from that, that AWS and, and Microsoft and Google did a great job explaining what uh, infrastructure as a service actually is, which is now kind of ripping off into the platform layer and eventually, I guess, the, the, the source layer. So I think there's a much greater under understanding of what that means and the b benefits that, that it can bring. Um, so, it, but, but it's been quick. I think just, yeah, let the last year or so, it's been a tremendous change. Yeah. Uh, I think it depends on the customer. You can take the two extremes. You, you have... Um, uh, a business that has got infrastructure that's still got multiple years to depreciate, perhaps a, a big public sector company, and um, the attractiveness of moving to cloud is, is perhaps for additional services that may be only for short-term usage. The other end of the spectrum, as, we, as we've just seen from the last case study, is it's a brand new build, and it's very 
easy, I'm not sure that's the right term, but it's more straightforward <coughs> to do 100% cloud deployment. There is a vast number of customers between those two extremes. And I think that's where the flexibility of being able to, to buy what you need for your business, perhaps it is an on-prem solution for 80% of it, but perhaps it's been able to have that flexibility of, of buying elastic page of services when you need it to do what you need to do with it. Mm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, very much so. I, I think it's really down to the client requirements and uh, actually looking at new business models as well, um, something that they may not have considered before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having the agility and flexibility to um, uh, run a service for a day or, or a week um, uh, gives them a, a very different uh, look on what they can do within the business. Good. I, I'm going to take another question so we can switch things around a little bit. And, and there's one that's just come in that I think is fantastic. Do you see a day when we have an entire TV studio in the cloud, I guess, minus the cameras, it says, helpfully. Um, so in other words, will we get to the stage that the vast majority of production technology, whether it's for live signal or for um, you know, file-based workflows, will we get to the point that everything's just in the cloud and we don't need to worry about it? Or is that kind of far-fetched? Uh, Ramki, you kind of do quite a lot of that end-to-end, -end, so. Yeah, I think it's an evolution. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I do see that. Uh, but, you know, it's going to take some time and, you know, live, and you know, live is sort of still sort of on the edge in terms of sort of um, you know getting there uh, from a reliability and you know and, and people having the sort of risk taking ability to kind of you know take the leap. But yeah, it, you know, it'll take it'll take some time, but we'll get there. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at um, uh, processes that can be automated. You know, that uh, traditionally are done by humans that can be done by machine learning technology. So uh, there's a number of those in development that we're working through at the moment. So we can definitely see a lot of these processes moving up onto the cloud to be managed um, uh, autonomously. Mm. Uh, any thoughts in terms of uh, what you're seeing there? I mean, we're doing a bunch of stuff around global news production. That's going to be completely in the cloud. Um, uh, I, I think it, you know, it's, it's, it's going to vary as well because of some of the channels are going to lend themselves to be completely automated. You know, there's no reason why. AI couldn't be used to auto create schedules, you know, no human intervention at all. But there's also going to be a, a need to have that, that um, art of, of content creation as well. So the tools for that may exist in the cloud. But going back to my point earlier, the, the user just needs to have the capability. They don't really care where it's hosted or how it works. So one of the things we've seen kind of recently that the public cloud providers have been promoting <coughs> quite heavily is the idea of a marketplace of different services and plugins. And we heard about microservices earlier. And Eric, I, I know at, uh, I think it was IDC this year, you launched your own kind of equivalent of, of uh, like a platform. Yeah, good enough, yeah. Combination of a technology platform and a marketplace. And there's a good question where, uh, what are your predictions about what's going to happen to these cloud marketplaces? Are they going to become important? Do you still need things to glue them together? Does that become a solution in the future? Will we even need to go to kind of integrators? Or will it all, where do you see that playing out? No, I, I think definitely there's room for, for integrators. If you look at the history of, of, of IT, software, and, and so on, this is just another, another technology that can, gets commoditized. And what happens is that you kind of commoditize from the ground up, but eventually you come to the source layer. And of course, there's always, even Salesforce is customized these days, right? But it's still a source solution. So of course, there are going to be marketplace and different business models uh, and all that. But on the, to make real va value and innovation on top of that, there's always going to be room for, for um, creative engineers and software designers and, and so on, of course. Any other thoughts on those marketplaces? No, I think it's, 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 that's the advantage of the cloud. Uh, that your ability to kind of you know have dynamically uh, resources available uh, for you to connect and if there's a new end use that's coming up and you need to wrap something up quickly i think marketplace is a great place to go sort of leverage some of those functionalities that's available on tap mm. i think that's great and you know how it gets used i think it's it, it'll evolve i mean if you really look at how cloud vendors tend to sell today um, it's um, you know while we all <laughs> say it's on demand and so on and so forth i think if you look at fundamentally how everybody wants to sell Everybody wants to sort of sell capacity sort of 12, 24 months and 36 months ahead of time. And so, you know, whether somebody would dynamically use it, the answer is yes. You know, it'll, it'll happen. I want to turn for the f final two or three minutes just to thinking about how you run, if thinking for the benefit of vendors here who are thinking about particularly moving into more of an as-a-service model and the, the challenges of doing that. Um, I'd like each of you really just to give a flavor of what is it that, that you need to do in your business, uh, and I think you touched on this earlier, to to really be a true cloud 
service rather than somebody who's paying lip service to it. Uh, yeah, let's yeah I, I think that, that um, uh, solid uh, software design is more important than ever. You have to do all, all the things around uh, testing, backward compatibility, all of course, in an as-a-service <coughs> world, all customers are getting the same, the same software, more or less. Meaning that, that you also need to uh, cater for all the various variants in that. So good, so solid, good software design from ground up is absolutely key. You can't cheat on that. So, so I think I would, uh, you know, the key thing is to be very clear on what's important to the customer and um, be flexible in how that shapes as the service evolves. So uh, you know, start small, start, start, uh, start clearly with what the value proposition is and really refine it, refine it, refine it. I think transparency of the service that you're providing, make sure that everybody would, can see what's happening with that and the agility to adapt to new situations within their business. Yeah, I think initially, you know, things like egress costs and stuff like that were very threatening, you know, as the concept of it, saying that I don't incur that now, you know, I'm gonna incur this. Uh, but I think people sort of are uh, in reconciling the fact that it is not that sort of, you know, if you really do the spreadsheets and do the actual sort of volume of traffic that goes through, uh, those are not going to be the ones. But the key ones I think are strategically important is the application layer <coughs> and the dynamism that it brings to them uh, for, for their business needs. Good. Now we have 90 seconds left, so I want to ask one more question, which I think is also important, and it reflects a couple of questions that have come in. And that is, you're all dependent on the big public cloud providers for your cloud services in one way or another. Um, what are the challenges of working with the likes of AWS and, uh, and Azure and Google, Google Cloud Platform, are they easy to work with if you're a relatively small vendor? First of all, they are very different, and this is a session of its own. Uh, but you have to do your homework on, on, on checking what made, if you take the three largest one, what made Google, AWS, and Microsoft successful in the previous life in the sense that they even existed 20 years ago, and what are their strategies, where Google is great at commoditized to complement, AWS have an insane innovation cycle, and Microsoft is good at never giving up and just, you know, run with it until they... So you have to do a little bit of history lesson on how they acted in the past and see how that fits for your, for your future. Paul, briefly. For us, so many things we could do. The biggest challenge we have is what do we do first? Yeah, I think as a, a perhaps a smaller player that um, uh, we, we've been uh, relatively easy to integrate with uh, AWS and Azure. Um, and uh, we've, we've had great feedback from them, so it, it hasn't been uh, uh, too difficult for us to do that. I think if there's one thing that the, you know, AWS, Google, and public clouds have really done is democratize the, uh, the whole process for any, anybody, right? I mean, if uh, being a small vendor uh, actually now puts you on par with a big vendor, mm -hmm. uh, and cloud gives you instant tools and so on and so forth, it's all about software and you know, the agility with which you are able to sort of you know, bring in innovation there really will what will distinguish you. And, and there's a level playing field thanks to these vendors.